I just wanted to say welcome and thank you so much for attending this. This is our second panel discussion uh, looking at, in particular, race and the me race in the media and diversity, but not just race in the media. Come and sit down. It's all right, no problem. Uh, race and diversity, but more inclusion even. It's part of a, a wider project that we're running, a UAL initiative. And it is a unique initiative. If you've not come to one of these before, I tried to explain last time. We're connecting up the journalism courses at London College of Fashion and here at LCC. And we're working together to try and make things better in terms of attainment for students from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds, which is an issue. So we're attempting to do that by highlighting some issues around inclusion and having a chat about it. Uh, to help me do that, we did have a slight change in personnel for the panel, and I'll explain. They, they, they sent their apologies, they couldn't make it. We were supposed to have Vanessa Kingori from GQ and Kenya Hunt from L, and they weren't able to make it. Being a journalist is sometimes hectic, so. But I'm very pleased to say, last minute sub, fantastic. So, uh, still joining us is Morris McLeod, who I've written up as a freelance writer and commentator, but there's so much more. You've written for The Spectator, The Guardian, The Voice newspaper. You're also a director of Media Diversified, which is about getting more diverse faces, responding and talking about news issues and big issues out there. Is that fair? Is that how I describe it? Yeah, it's about, yeah, diversifying the media, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> And beside Morris is Michelle Matheson, who's a talent executive with Shiver um, and is on ITV's diversity board and essentially makes telly. I think that's a good way of describing it. <laughs> yeah, or I get the people who make telly to make telly. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Uh, and, and as a member of ITV's diversity board, it's one of the guardians of making sure that we see more inclusion on television when we're turning on. And last minute sub, so, but nothing least about this man, uh, Nepal Daliwal, who's a writer, commentator you may a few years ago have read him as a columnist in, in Evening Standard but also you can see his writing in The Guardian, Times of India, you can see him writing across lots of different publications and an author as well. Um, so thank you for the last minuteness, I appreciate it and I'm lucky enough to say I used to work with Nepal so I, I know he's uh, good at this and it's a good conversation we've got coming. We're talking about inclusion, if you have questions of course we'll make time at the end for you to, to put those questions forward but um, it's not that kind of panel where we won't stop and talk to you. So if you've got a question, put your hand up. We'd love to talk to you at any point. If you're a bit nervous about that, maybe wait till the end, but we're gonna to talk till about five. And then you might spot there's some wine and some fruit juice across the way, which, and some sweets even. So, you know, as a thank you for coming and engaging, we've got that for you too. I know, we're the gift that keeps on giving. Um, so we'll get this started if that's all right. And, I, and again, in our last panel that we did, we talked about fashion in particular, but obviously since then, there's been somebody appointed as the head of Vogue, British Vogue, who isn't exactly the normal profile. Edward Enerfield's been appointed the, to successor to Alexandra Shulman, and I just wanted to check, is that diversity done and sorted then? Can I start with you, Morris? Uh, it's, a, it's a good thing, you can't, you can't um, I think it would be um, foolish not to, to celebrate that um, a guy and a, a black guy is, is head of British Vogue. That's, that's, that's something worth, worth flagging up, but no, I think we're a long way from diversity being sorted. But you know, every, every step in the right direction is a good one, I'd say. Uh, Michelle, were you shocked to see that that happened? I was shocked, but I, I think I echo what you were saying as well, is that I think it's, it's great to have a, a, a figurehead the top of something that's so institutional in British Vogue, so I think it's a great thing. And it makes people think differently, because once they see that there's somebody who's different from the norm, being you know, the guardian or custodian of a particular institution, then um, it's, it's a good thing, and it helps me in a, in a funny sort of way. It always helps me, because you just think, well, that's happening there, so why isn't this happening here? So whether or not further down the line um, it, things need to change, which I think you're probably alluding mm. to, I think it's a good thing. Your reaction to the news? I mean, fashion's a particular part of the journalism industry. It's a good part of it. It, it, it is, it's an influential part. Many of the people watching us today have an eye on becoming fashion journalists. So, again, your reaction. This is great news, but, I mean, I will say that it's a, it's a man. He's, a, he's black, brilliant. But it was a, woman, a woman's post for a bit, and now we've got a man in post. There's n it's never perfect. To be honest, I if there was going to be one magazine, or one area of British 
the British media where you were going to see a black person succeed. It would be fashion, if I had to bet. You know, it would be fashion. That's an interesting bet. Because it's, um, you've already got a strong black influence in the British fashion industry already. And um, fashion, the fashion industry likes to fetishize black people, let's be honest about it. Okay. That's what it does. I mean, it's what, it was, it's what it's always done for the past 30 years. So um, the promotion of a black individual into that position, for me, was not a surprise. And also, uh, like Alexander shulman has been there for uh, God knows how long. Um, that's such a hot seat to sit in. I mean... He's got pedigree. He's you yeah, know, worked with magazines. I also He's know worked magazines with are very cynical. Yeah. Okay. I know magazines are very, very cynical. So, um, it's just a, it might well be just, just a tryout. This is an interesting, I didn't expect anyone to say it to watch this space, but it could be. <laughs> well, British Vogue, it suddenly gets the whole world talking about British Vogue, which no one does. American Vogue is one everybody talks about. And suddenly British Vogue is the one that everybody will be talking about all over the world. <laughs> but that's a good thing, eh? That is a great thing. Mm. But it's a PR thing, it's something, it's not, there's nothing bad in this. Mm. There's nothing, there's no downside to this. Mm. It is a positive. But um, I would also say, you know, don't count the chickens just yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that might be the tone for the chat. Um, okay, so I, I suppose I need to ask you to kind of set the tone after that question. Inclusivity, 2017, you know, what does it mean to you when it comes to media and journalism in the UK? It's a huge question I've just asked, by the way. So pick any bit that you are happy with. Michelle, can you start with that one? It's a new word. You know, they have these buzzwords. Okay, when I started, like when Vivian started many years ago, when she was like an whippersnapper, couldn't hold her own when she was in Amsterdam. Hey, I'm giving that, extra, I'm giving that story. Now. Um, but um, every, every three or four years, there's a new word that's thrown in. It was multiculturalism, it was black, it was, uh, I don't know, they've gone through so many ramifications and now we've got inclusivity. Diversity was this word that I felt very uncomfortable with and now we've got inclusivity which I think I feel more comfortable with because it includes everybody. So for example I've just interviewed for a departmental runner working at Shiver and I wanted to see a breadth of young people who wanted to come into the industry. I wasn't just seeing black and Asian, minority ethnic, B-A-M-E, that's another buzzword. Um, I wanted just to see some young people who were really passionate about working in television. And I saw big, small, uh, disabled, able-bodied, black, white, Asian, and I chose the best person from that bunch. And that's what inclusivity is. Well, I, when I rang up and I had to give my, I'm so sorry, but you didn't make it this time. However, I want to see you again in X amount of months. I want you to come in and meet me. I want to mentor you. I want to coach you. It's because I believe that young people who want to get into this industry have to be really quite thick skinned, have to be prepared to be completely freelance and have to kind of embrace what this industry is. And, um, and for that, I want to ensure that the people that I pass in the street when I'm walking from the station to here are the same people who I've got working at ITV. So that's my kind of raising debt for how I, how I, how I am, and how I kind of embrace inclusivity. And I think it's really, really important. There are cynics about it. There are people who can be quite critical about it. But that's my own personal thing. But I think I've always had that. It's just another word. Um, <coughs> Morris, inclusive. Journalism, 2017, inclusive media. Mm, um, <coughs> I don't know. I, mean, I, I, I suppose, uh, yeah, the, the words still do change <laughs> all the time. You're, you're right. Um, I suppose my 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 concern about um, inclusivity, about even the term inclusivity, is that it it suggests that there's a level playing field. Now, I'm sure in the recruiting that you're doing, you went through some, yeah, you jumped through extra hurdles to make sure that the. <laughs> okay, yeah. To make sure, to make sure that the, the people being um, who were in front of her were were look like you know the people she passes uh, on, on on the way to, to here. Um, that's great. I don't think that is often the case. So so what? So so I can only talk about my career, for instance. So so um, we were at the same um, journalism college, um, and uh, yeah, twenty 
something years ago. Yeah, um, there, did you? <laughs> and 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 so and so when and you know when you're studying, you're you're right alongside, um, you know, your peers, and you you see, yeah, you know, especially over the course of a year, you see kind of who's good at this and who's good at that and where you fit in. Um, and, and so when when I went to start looking for jobs at the end of the course. There, there was really nothing, and I, and I was going alongside, um, you know, people who were getting jobs at the times and jobs at the, and and and, and so you got you got a, a first the first thing you do is go okay maybe I'm just quite not as good as them. You, you have to you know you have to be humble enough to assume to to, <coughs> to look at that option. But when you've been working alongside people for a year, you kind of go, well actually no, I I know how good that person's work is, and I know I know sometimes they're good at this, sometimes they're bad at that. I know where I fit in. I'm not. I'm not awful. I'm not. I'm not um, really bad at this at, at this career. So, it, and and I have this conversation with with a lot of my um, peers as we go through and their careers. You know, they're editing the Spectator or they're you know they're editing uh, Mix Mag and, and and whatever. You know, they're they're doing these big jobs and and I'm still sort of freelancing and hustling around. And we we meet up and have conversations. Um, and they'd always say, oh, but you know. It, it, why aren't you getting on? And, and there isn't an answer. I don't, you know, when you're looking at the individual, you can look at diversity as a general and say, okay, well, as you say, 94% of journalists are white out of an 87% population, and 0.4% are black, 0.2% are black, 0.4% are Muslim. You can look at all those figures in general, but when you're looking at, when you're talking about yourself individually, it's very hard to sort of go, or to not go, maybe I'm just not that good. Maybe I'm just not. Up there, so 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 so, I was, I was, so so coming back to inclusivity, I think that that um, and I, I know okay. So I'll, I'll give you I'll give you I'll tell you one story that um, uh, one of my classmates, still a really good friend of mine, um, she went for an interview at the Express. Um, we both ended up working at the Express, which is a pretty awful place to work. But anyway, she went, we went for an inter she went for her interview there, and the editor said. Oh my God! Your dad was my men you know, was was my mentor when I, when when I was coming through. And so her dad was a senior journalist. That's I can't compete with that. My mum's a nurse. It's not we're not on the same level. And so when when we meet up afterwards, she'd go, Oh God, you're you're still doing shifts. And I'm like, Yeah, you started. You we both walked in the door. You started in a different place. Um, and yeah, it might be that I'm only good enough to do shifts. It might be. I have to be honest. I don't think so, but it might be. You have to admit, you have to see that you had some sort of advantage. You have to see that there was a, a boost that you got to your career. Um. Sorry, we're yeah. just making sure people aren't waiting at the door to get in. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you because mm. when I, at the same position as you, sure. when I left, there were colleagues of mine and we were, I thought, the same. Yeah. And it took me a year and a half after leaving to get some kind of proper contract <coughs> where colleagues of mine were walking straight in yeah. to jobs. And honestly, probably till you've just said that, I've never considered. I always just assumed it was me, oh. and that could that then that could be a gender thing mm -hmm. as well, <laughs> because women have a horrible habit of assuming it's them anyway. Yeah. Um, and it's not a bad thing to check your check yourself. It might be you, but it might not. So yeah, but now in 2017, because you know we're not young. Uh, that was then, Morris. <laughs> this is now. Yeah. Um, and we've got people like Michelle hiring. <laughs> you saying I'm old? No, I'm saying you're hiring. <laughs> <laughs> there are, I think there are. I think there are more opportunities. It, there can't, it's it's hard to say because I'm not. I'm not in that place now. I'm not. I'm not sort of whatever age, just starting off and knocking on doors and whatever. I'm in, I'm sort of in a different place. Um, <coughs> it feels like there are more opportunities because there are more senior, and it doesn't, you don't need to have someone. Someone black or Asian in a senior position, for, you know, to to hire hire. You have to have someone with the right mindset. You have to have someone with the right mindset. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, right mindset. I, it feels like we're getting away from if you didn't go to this school and speak in this way, then you're not you don't fit in. I, it feels like there's a deliberate, um, even even if they're dragging and screaming into it, there's a deliberate right. We need to find other voices. That that feels like that's going on. Okay, so that's a positive to land on you, know, pal. Other voices are they being heard? Is, is inclusion working as a as an approach? Doesn't even need to be. To be honest, um, the British media is a stitch up. He's right. It's a stitch up, top to bottom. And whoever it's Michelle, isn't it? whoever Michelle is hiring, and whoever Michelle gets the hire, they'll be after Philippa, Toby, and Hermione have all got their jobs. <coughs> their mums and dads 
and the rest of them, after they've all been taken care of, then Michelle will be given what's left over to disperse. Mm. But because that's I, how I, TV I, works. TV, TV, does, no, TV, does, TV does work like that. There, you can't. You can't. There's just no. I mean, you can't disagree that that's how you can't disagree that does still happen, that but it doesn't happen. Well. It doesn't massively. happen as much as it used to. It might not happen as much, but yeah, it still happens. It happens but massively. how can you stop that happening? You know, you're working, your mum, you're working, and your son wants to be in TV. You're there. I then it's oh, he's met he's met you at when he was when he was little, yeah. and they remember him. And oh my God, Toby, but you've grown so I've, much. Blah blah blah. blah. And think, the next minute, Toby's working as a runner. I, but I also think, and we'll move up the ladder quite quickly. I think it's perfectly um, reasonable to say that people who are in the positions of sort of you know creating a wedge for other people to yeah. get through should be far more vocal and outspoken and angry about that and not let Toby and Philippa and Hermione get their, their jobs from mm. their, their parents and their parents' friends yeah. and the rest of it. I'm very vocal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ITV is a great place to work. I, can't work I, I will, and for full disclosure, <laughs> Michelle just bought me lunch and we went and had lunch at ITV. <coughs> and I will say, uh, being someone that works at the BBC still, um, as a freelancer, albeit, but the canteen looked for a it served better food. Uh, I've been guilty of it all this all this time, all wrong. Um, and b it was it was a, a youthful place and a, an inclusive place. There were people. You're talking about in front of the counter, or <laughs> <laughs> no, right, that's another conversation. But actually, not in front of the counter. The people that they, they were paying for the food, not being not serving it. There's an official. The, you can. You can <laughs> Basically, when you get after over about 40 grand a year, mm -hmm. you start to see everything becoming bleached out. Now, that, I don't, well, okay. That, I won't deny. That's None true. of us can say that. Deny. I absolutely agree with you. Like, like, so you can, you know, you can <coughs> hand out all the jobs you want, you know, as far as they're concerned. Internships, yeah, give them out like smarties. Mm. They Two can't, weeks. Yeah, they can't have enough free, free people. Two weeks. Yeah, I mean, they, they're not going to say no to free labour. You know, Only two uh, weeks we're allowed to do that, I just want to make that very yeah, clear. They're not going to say no to free labour and having lots of really young, good looking people in you know, funky outfits running around reception. He's talking about you by the way. With the, clipboards, <laughs> with the clipboards, you know, when people come into the office, it looks great. You know, it's a great PR strategy. It looks very, very good. But at 40 grand a year, um, it's not just, when, when I say bleached out, it's not, I'm not saying it's apartheid, it's basically because that's where Hermione and Toby and everybody really, really dig their heels in from that point onwards. And um, I you'll probably find more Tobys than Hermione's, yes. if I'm honest. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I think yeah. what will happen True. as well is Hermione's. I'm. I'm Hermione. Hermione. Hermione, thank you. Harry <laughs> <laughs> Potter. Harry Potter. Um, um, we'll go off and have babies and then find it really difficult yeah. to get back in. And that's another area of inclusivity that I'm very passionate about. Okay, so this is the point where I stick in some hard information, as we like to call it in our journalism oh, teaching. Uh, okay, so Morris mentioned actually another university that, whose name shan't be mentioned. Um, they did, a, they did some research in this area and they found 94%, at the moment, 94% of journalists are white in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, they have some figures on Muslim journalists and they have some figures on black journalists. Black journalists, 0.2% are black. And, and three, hang on, let me uh, prefer to say that's right. So of the population, there's 13% of the population is black and 0.2 of the working journalists are black. I don't know if that's working population. I don't yeah. know how they did that with the figures. I think the 13% is, it's weird term, non-white. So it depends. Okay, on that's a that. bigger figure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, right, yeah, two point five percent of working journalists are Asian, and that's seven, they're seven percent of the general population apparently, and zero point four percent of journalists are Muslim compared to five percent of the population. And by the way, fifty five percent of journalists are male, and that's actually gotten better recently. But guess who's getting paid more? Men. Well, it's worth, if, if while, while we're on that, if, um, the Sutton Trust did, um, did, a, did looked at looked at class as well, and um, of seven seven percent of people go to private school, but they make up fifty one percent of top journalists. And by top journalists, they mean the people that are actually earning the decent money. And then of um, fifty four percent of top journalists were Oxbridge educated, and Oxbridge makes up one percent of the population. So that's 
that's just a massive disparity. It's yes. it's, it's a club for for, for private school and most people. <coughs> yeah. Well, okay. And then just to make it more depressing, I want to cheer things up in a minute. I swear. Two thousand and two, a similar survey found that ninety six percent of British journalists were white. So it's moved two percent in over what, fourteen years. Wow. 15 years, that's yeah. not depressing at all. It would, but it would be interesting, Kat, to have the um, stats on who actually studies journalism. Mm. Yes, and it, this the study of journalism has exploded in comparison, <laughs> if you think of it, it. There wasn't much of it around when I was trying to break into it, and I had to wait till a postgrad and to sit with Morris and to do that at a different mm -hmm. university from here. And now it is around the country, and you can do it, and it's still not that prolific. So I can't tell you that we haven't got those figures. We haven't got figures about the LGBTQ communities. And I mean, anecdotally, I can tell you I've worked with lots of gay people. Mm. Um, not that many gay women, definitely gay men. And I can tell you that I've never worked with a trans journalist. So I don't know what's changing. Can I just want, I just want to make a point um, to the people we were talking about previously, because I don't want to put any of you lot off. <laughs> that's, that's, that's such a, I mean, like, I mean, it's a real bummer having to listen to what I'm going to cheer up, it's alright, so I'm going to bring But also, be under no illusions, and you've got to play a much smarter game than just being good at your job. If you think just being smart at your job is the way to do it, it's not. Um, you've got to play a much smarter and a much more lateral game. Um, and if you want to make money, like proper money, like choose a different career. Um, that's quite <laughs> that's right. I, I'd be quite honest with you. But if you really, really want to do this, then you have to play a much smarter game than just being good at your job and showing up and putting in the hours. Um, so you have to do all that as a, as a yeah, level like I'll one. I'll give you an example yeah. like what I think is one, like a really, really smart game that got played. Um, Amal Rajan, he basically became friends with um, um, Evgeny Lebedov, whose dad bought the standard and the independent for one pound, uh, ex KGB oligarch. <laughs> so Amal Rajan was just a flunk in, um, in, in the newsroom at the Evening Standard, <laughs> like no one heard of him. He was doing bits and pieces. Becomes buddy buddies with uh, Evgeny Lebedev. You know, next he's the first non white editor of a national newspaper in Britain. Um, and the fact that and, he, that's he, open he, and he's a smart guy. Friends. This is not to say he's not a smart guy. Right? He's a very smart guy and I think he did as good as you could do with The Independent because I think it was a hiding to nothing, that paper anyway. Um, I think but, networks are important. Yeah, you've got to play a smarter game and basically when you walk, in, walk into a situation, figure out who is the person who says yes and no. There's going to be lots of people bullshitting you, pretending they're the ones who've got power and stuff, but no, you find out who is the real decision maker and make sure you know the organ grinder and not many of his monkeys <laughs> who will be around the office <laughs> pretending they're hot stuff. And that is, that's the, that's the, you've got to be smarter than just being good at your job. You know, and it takes so much energy and so much intelligence as well. Like you could, you would, you, you'd just make an awful lot more money doing something else if you're <laughs> smart enough to do that, quite frankly. Okay, now, I'm gonna stop you because this is depressing. Uh, and let me vouch for these students who I've had the pleasure of teaching. They are smart and they do get it. But what, what they can do, uh, and all of the journalists here, whatever their background, whatever the issue they may feel makes them worthy of inclusion, they can create a network. They can look after each other. And I would say I'm lucky enough to know uh, yeah. to either know you or have been introduced to you by people I know. And that network is important and we should celebrate it, I think. So that's not a bad thing. Like, you know, we stop working together, but we never stop saying hello. That's the way you do it, isn't it? There is a positive here. But you have to, what I'm saying, just figure out the lay of the land when you walk, when you walk into this industry. Figure out the lay of the land. And what I'm, in my experience, the higher you go up the, the ladder, the more open-minded people are. So you, at your immediate level, where, where, you're, where you'll enter, and in, and in the middle ranks, there's a lot of very dumb people who are going to get in your way. But if you can find a way to talk to people who are you know, higher up the food chain, you'll find people who genuinely are much more uh, appreciative of smart people, because they're smart. That's why they got there. So that's very true. That's absolutely very true. And I wish, in some ways, I'd known that when I was 
and coming into the industry. I think I was so grateful that sort of feeling of, oh my God, I'm in television. <laughs> it was just like, oh, my name's on the credits. You know, it was that kind of thing. And I think, I think you, you're so grateful and you continue to be so grateful. And I am, don't get me wrong. I am very grateful and very thankful for every day. But there is this sort of feeling that you don't then dare to to reach out and talk to somebody um, and then you realize when you're sat in with your MD and you're talking through stuff that you know more than your MD or you know more than your production exec you know you know you know you're you're on, on the same sort of level that when people are listening to you you think oh damn wish I'd done this a bit earlier so I think there is number one um, this isn't an industry where you're going to make tons of money but this is an industry where you're going to make a name for yourself um, I think you're all smart, you're probably all blogging or vlogging. We are bamboozled by all of this. Do it, come and say, well, I've got this blog out here and I did this, this. And I'm just like, oh, they're so super smart. And honestly, a girl got a job the other day because she bamboozled me with science in the sense of, I've got this blog and I've got this blog and I've done this and I've done this and I've created this online web series. And I'm just like, want her in. Because as far as I know, I want to get as much info and make as much money from that person, because we're a commercial ITV, to make as much money as I can from that person and her ideas. So it's the same thing. So if you've got that, your content is your currency, your ideas are your currency. So in a way, you have to really protect your currency, protect your ideas. You have to make sure that they get to the right person, I think. And I think that's probably part of this. You know, you are going to find very bitchiness when you come into an industry and everyone's having a go and you're getting clustering together and all that person. Forget that. Play mm -hmm. it. Yeah, yeah. But make sure you've got your eye on the prize. Don't let don't, you know, let that out of your sight. Don't think the boss is unapproachable. Yeah, it's not. Don't think yeah. that. Boss he, likes it. He was a nobody as well once. Yeah, no, no, yeah, that's well, true. Unless he was called Toby. Probably a somebody's son. <laughs> 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 probably a Toby. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Enough with the flipping human I love. Um, so let's talk. Uh, well, I, I want to because we have no plan here. I'm going to ask a question about confessional journalism and journalism that's about yourself. So again, I know lots of you guys here will be happy blogging about yourselves. Talking of blogging, you'll be blogging about your lives. You'll be Instagramming everything. Um, from what you know happens, what you have for breakfast in a beautiful bowl shot from above, or you know where you were in the evening, whatever it is. But confessional journalism, I think, I think it's fair to say, it can take its toll. You did some of that probably about ten years ago yeah, now. About ten years ago. Uh, for for a little while, and um, I was. I, I still want, do it to some extent. Tell us more about it. I mean, you, your approach into it was. It was kind of like when I did it before. It was more like a, I did it from a sort of middle finger point perspective of like, um, I had a, my wife at the time was writing an awful lot of stuff about me and then I had a column too so I started saying, I started being quite reactive <laughs> and, and provocative and she was saying she'd be writing about what a dirtbag I was. And so, I so let's make it good, Liz Jones is yeah. Nepal's ex-wife so if you know about that story you may have read about it a few years ago so you were, it was banter back and forth yeah. but you were both getting paid yeah. and you were getting attention. Yeah, but I would not do that now. What changed then? Uh, I did, I mean, I've, I write about my pro personal life now. I've written about being in therapy, I've written about being, de having depression, and, um, but very honestly, from the heart, in a way that, like, is, um, um, for, for partly because it's therapeutic, because so much of that kind of stuff is to do with your own personal shame. And in order to, like, well, once I've put it out there, well, I'm over that bridge. And hopefully, permission is there for other people to step over that bridge as well. But that's but, but when I was younger, it was very much kind of it was a it was a joke. I wasn't really like dealing with any sense of mission. It was just narcissism, really. Any warnings you'd give no, the next I, generation of journalists? The interesting thing is, um, like, um, like if you're blogging and vlogging, I mean, actually, you're the future. Like, you don't realise how. I, I recently learned this stat in the States, the top 10 most famous people for everybody under the age of 18 are online stars. Every single one of them. And um, that's just gonna get more and more and more. And, um, and the thing about being an online sensation as well is that um, you can be a big shot in British journalism and uh, you know, you'll get you know, maybe 
a hundred thousand people will read you, will care about what you say. You become an internet sensation. You maybe ten million people are going to be the, the and from my my sense of it, how this vlogging and this blogging stuff works is that uh, it's actually all about being very real. So. Um, um, it's how, it's how relatable you are, that's what seems to be... Uh, and not relatable to us either, relatable to people yeah. your age. Right. Not, we don't, yeah. we, you know, we don't get it. Carry on though. I mean, I'm, uh, on that point then, I need to bring this over <coughs> to you, Morris, because you, what you write is you, you write commentary about yeah. what's happening and how passionate you are about things. I know you talk about politics and you've got lots to say on it. Yeah. But again, would you... I've been warned not to talk about politics. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot. No one mentioned the C word. That <laughs> general um, but, but you know, you put yourself out there on a regular yeah. basis, you share your opinions, that must be hard. People come back at you. Yeah, 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 certainly. Um, to be honest, I don't, I don't feel like I do put myself out there that much. The, the commentary, the stuff I do for Garden mainly, it's, it's, I, I write comment pieces for them. And um, when, when I first started to do it, then it was, they always want you to relate it to yourself. So I'd write about the migration crisis and I relate it to my mum coming from Jamaica, or I'd write about, I've written about me choosing to go to a, refusing to go to a private school at 11 and going to a comprehensive and use that to talk about selective schools and, and, and whatever. But um, <coughs> it always feels very, I mean, I'm quite, I, I've, I feel like I was kind of born at the wrong time. I'm very much a, yeah, no secrets, know what you want. If I, if it were completely down to me, I'd be writing more about my frailties and sex and relationships. And when you've got a partner of 18 years, who kind of has put a veto on you writing about, you know, that sort of stuff. She should be allowed to do that. <laughs> no, well, yeah, I guess it's her life as well, but still it's, um, I do feel I would like to write more, but then, and there's also, but to be honest, there's also the thing of, um, when we talk, when you're talking about, um, the stuff that's wrong in you, the, the you know my insecurities, my I'm a, I'm a council estate boy who, who suddenly finds himself working in national newspapers with with everyone posh around me, um, and you can't help but feel insecure. I could write about that, but it feels as if you've got to kind of it feels as if that would that would inhibit my career in some way. It feels as if I've got to I've got to at least on some front be putting forward a hey I'm super confident and you know, able and you don't, you have got no problems if you employ me. I feel like I've, I still feel, even even at my ripe old age, like, well, I don't want to say too much about that. They might be, that might scare people off of hiring me or something, as if, as if that's a thing in the future. So I think it's a, I, 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 I totally agree. I, I, that's, that's the writing I like to read, and that's the writing I like to do, and it is cathartic, and it is, it's, it's real, and it gets out there, but you're properly leaving yourself open you know, um, the, the comments under the immigration piece about my mum were, were hideous, and that was on The Guardian, you know, and they do what they can to take out the really bad ones, so... Um, I guess a bit of it's been I'm really thick-skinned. Uh, I don't... I, I am a total narcissist. I love the idea that anybody, is, even someone that hates it, is reading something that I wrote, because, <laughs> you know, writing's quite personal. You put yourself into it, and if I on a train and I see someone reading I almost want to go, that's me, that's me. <laughs> and you know, I've not been doing it for 20 odd years. I still enjoy seeing that someone's reading my stuff. But yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. You can't, I don't feel like, um, I don't even yet feel like I completely go, Whoa, here's, all my, here's all my issues. There's more we could get from you. There's plenty more. <laughs> I think that's a, that, that, like, I think that's a real, in the traditional media, it's very easy to get to the job. It's very easy. Which, which you guys as bloggers and bloggers don't have to worry about that. Like actually, um, the beauty of what you do is that you don't have to, like, um, if it's not working, it doesn't matter because no one's looking at it. You only know people are looking at it because you're, you're, you're successful. You, you know it's working because you're getting hits. You don't have to worry about, is my editor going to think this? Or, you know, am I going to be put in this box? You can, you're like a free fire zone. In lots of ways, I actually really envy you actually. Like, um, I think I might have been born 20 years too late because I think that would have really suited me. But for the record, I still look at YouTube, so you can still put stuff on there and it still will get hits. So just so you know, don't, don't give them too much, just do it. That's what I'd say about that. Um, I'm going to move this on slightly because 
There's two more questions I want to ask. Um, and I want to finish with us talking about advice for the people who've come to see us. But before that, I must ask more about what's happening on screen. Uh, and we've talked about behind the camera mm -hmm. and the teams there, but on screen, is everything going all right? Is, is inclusion there? Because again, I can tell you that I'm seeing more um, BAME people, more black Asian minority ethnic people reflected on screen in news programmes. I'm seeing them not just, you know, being carted away from by, by, by the police. I'm also seeing them presenting the programme. Some of them are even reviewing newspapers. Um, so that's good, and, and we're seeing dramas, and they're changing. We're getting better at telling variety stories, aren't we? It is getting, it is getting we? better. It's getting better. It's not fair. It's like anything, but it's getting better, and it's so much better than say when I started. Although there was a period when I was um, younger, when I worked on programmes that were um, made for myself. I Black Britain, um, which is where I worked, met Viv, I think, and. Um, you know, I worked on, I worked in radio, I worked on, I did all sorts of different types of programmes. Um, it's got better. I think on screen, on screen portrayal is one of the things that, you know, you can really measure. What used to happen was if you put, say there was a series called Clocking Off, and it was a really brilliant series. It was set up in Manchester, and it was about the lives of the people who lived in the street and the works at the factory. And that's what it was. And every week they told a different story, a bit like Corrie, but more sort of souped up and a bit more kind of sexy. And, um, and each week they took a partner, couple, family, some kind of crisis. And one week they had a black couple who also worked at the factory, did exactly the same thing. And I was on the board, at the, I was working at the BBC then, and I remember them saying, oh, the figures are down. The figures are down for that particular episode. And if the figures come down, the BBC, and the BBC is saying that, when the figures come down on commercial television, people think, mm, I don't know, I don't, think the com I don't think the advertisers are going to want this because how it's funded is by its commercial activity. What they found now is that, that diversity, inclusion makes sense. You have that portrayal on screen in your advertising and your commercials, you get more people come into those programs and it's it's kind of been hand in hand so you'll probably see now if you look at commercials that they're much more diverse than they've ever been you know you see black people using soap soap powder <laughs> washing liquid washing up liquid um putting cream on their skin i don't know and you just think oh my god and i still do i go Oh. Or you see mixed families, you know, the happy kind of, you know, black mum, white dad, little fluffy mixed race kid in the middle, and you just think, oh my god, this is amazing. And that's what they're doing because they're portraying what's out there, who's buying their products. So in a sense, if you're um, writing about the things that you're seeing and you're influencing, because you are all influencers, then you're going to influence what's being sold, what's being made, what people are going to buy. If you're talking about fashion, if you're talking about beauty, all these sorts of areas which you probably work really well in, is that's what's going to influence the commercials that are made to support the programmes that are made, except, do you see what I mean? So in a sense, when I look at us compared to the rest of Europe, I think, blimey, we are, we are so far ahead. If I compare us to the States, maybe not so. So it's kind of, you know, we're, we're, we, I think we are definitely getting there. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm thrilled when I see Colin Salmon walk through or Idris walk through the door and I think, mm -hmm. Lenny Henry comes through the door, I think, okay, we're kind of, you know, it's good. A lot of men, I hasten to add. Not so many women, going back to your point earlier, Kat. So I think in some ways there are areas which are, you know, slightly do, do, doing better than others, but I think on the whole it's much better. For the record, recently the BBC, I'm going to ask you to comment in a second, Morris, but the BBC ran a Christmas promo uh, where it was a lovely promo. It's about oneness, which is a big BBC uh, marketing approach. Mm -hmm. And in it, a gay couple kiss. Mm -hmm. Two men kiss. It was the most complained about thing they've had in years. <laughs> Literally years. I know this because of the job that I do. So. And yet, as an, as an, as an audience member watching it, think, oh my God, that's amazing. You just think, yes. Because why not? It's like, it's, that's our life. That's, that's, how, that's who we pass as we walk around. And I know London's in a bubble. I know. And you'll find if you go out into the regions that you're probably, that it feels like you're way ahead of where they're at. But you know what? They, they follow you. So you are the sort of trailblazers and you have to keep 
pushing. You know, you'll go abroad. You'll, you, some of you might not ever work in this country. You might, you might work abroad. You might work in Africa, Asia, China, Japan. You might work somewhere else where you just think, but your, your experience here is going to influence what you do when you go and work abroad. So you might not even have to leave your house. You can do it online. Because <laughs> I'm not thinking you have to go somewhere, but actually you don't have to physically move anywhere, do you? It's you Skype. Just, just Skype. <laughs> um, so yeah, but what I'm saying is that you're influential with what you're doing and, and the way that you see the world, just as we were, in the way that we saw the world when we were younger. Morris, on screen, how are we doing? Um, I don't know, the screen, the screen thing's interesting, isn't it? I, I think that um, if, if you're talking film and TV, um, it... it it feels like something's happening, but then it's, there's been times when it's felt like that in the past and it kind of dies out. So well, last year you had the Oscars So White thing. This year you have Moonlight winning and you've got films like Get Out and, and, and stuff like that that, that, that that to me feel, they feel different to, to, to black films or whatever they've been in the past and that they, they don't feel as if they're just aimed at a black audience. I don't know about, maybe, maybe Get Out kind of is, but, but uh, Moonlight, for instance, it, to me, felt like a mainstream film that just happened to be, yeah, it's, it's broke back prompts, isn't it? It's, 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 a, it's, a, um, it's, a, a, um, too much to it, too much to it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. But, but, yeah, but, um, and, and the fact that those films are out and are successful, like you say, it's all about the dollars. It's, mm. you know, I, I don't, I don't think that, um, that discrimination or whatever, yeah, you know, sometimes it happens because of internal issues, but it's often just, ooh, we don't think that'll sell. And so if you, so when the evidence is there, look, here's, here's a film about, a, about a gay guy in Florida or wherever, and you know, and here's a, here's a film about how it feels to be the one black guy in a, in a, in a liberal sort of um, uh, um, environment. Those, those things, the fact that those things were out there and successful and critically acclaimed means there'll be more of them. So, um, I'm hopeful, I guess, in that state. And then you, you know, look at things like um, I grew up on comics, and and I never really even noticed that there weren't any any black or Asian, you know, heroes or not, not really. And then suddenly you've got things like Luke Cage doing really well, and the Black Panther film coming out, and and you still have some odd stuff. You still have some appropriation. You still have white guys being kung fu masters and things like that, but. It feels like we're kind of getting there a little bit. I, I don't know if it's, and um, um, I guess it's not. It's because it's not my medium. I don't. You know, I work in print. Um, I'm, I'm not got the face for for telly. I'm. A, I'm, a, I'm a, but you would have watched. <laughs> you would have watched telly as a child. Mm. I think children's television tends to be much more inclusive. It tends to have everybody in it. And I thought. I think about. I grew up on Thunderbirds, the, the string ones, not the cartoon one now. And I always thought Parker was black because he looked like my uncle. So as far as I was concerned, <laughs> it's only somebody who recently said to me, "No, he's not black, Michelle." Like, he is. Did you think he was black? I don't know. He looked like him, and and in my in my my world, it was you know he had Uhuru in in Star Trek. You know there was just like I was going to live into. He was the exotic. Two. Well, not exotic. She was driving the ship. So as far as I was concerned, she was pretty cool. So in a sense, you know, sometimes you find that when you're growing up, all these images are really really important for how you become because I grew up thinking yeah you know and I grew up in the 70s and it was quite kind of power and political not so much today it seems fairly one-sided anyway but we won't go so we promise we weren't going to do no, politics no, yeah. um but I just think I just think it depends on what you're what you see as you're growing up that kind of shapes who you are and whilst you're in this kind of cocoon of of being at uni and, and learning different things you're learning more about people you've never come into contact with and it all kind of shapes who you are as you grow up, so like yourself, came from what you know, lived on a council estate, and I grew up on a council estate. Very, very happy, actually, by the way. Very happy kind of memories of growing up there. But I went to and I ended up at Central School of Speech and Drama, where everybody was incredibly posh and incredibly entitled. And I just thought, my God, this is amazing. These people are just so weird and kind of wonderful. <laughs> and I, and you know, and you just no. kind of grow to to understand how where they're coming from, and more importantly. They get to understand me, and, and you know, 20, 30 years on, I'm still one of their best mates. Because for them, it was like it was a world. They, I took them into a world that they didn't know about as much as they took me into a world that I didn't know about. And I can equally straddle both. 
Whereas, you know, they might not, but they can at least say, well, I've got a friend who is, you know. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is, in a very roundabout way, is that it does shape you. So images and things that you see as a young person, and even as someone in the ages that you are now, is very important for how you go about and become a writer, become a journalist, become someone who works in television, who works in print, who writes novels and books. It's all going to shape your experience, and that's really, really important. Yeah, pal, your thoughts on this? I quickly want, before I was to talk about the screen, I wanted to pick up something Michelle like had said earlier. Mm -hmm. You mentioned they might go and work abroad. Mm -hmm. Don't discount that. Mm -hmm. Like, um, right now in, um, in India, the English language media is exploding. There's 20 million new people speaking English in India every year at the moment. Um, sim the same sort of thing is happening in West Africa and other mm -hmm. parts of the world as well and um, massive demand for the sort of skills that you're going to be walking out of here from you know, a well-established, well-known university. Mm. Uh, you will get jobs in those countries very, very easily. And you'll make money. And you'll make money. And, but the other <laughs> thing you'll get is you, that you'll be allowed to have a degree of responsibility you will not be allowed to have here as a straight out of university. Okay. They, will let, they will give you a lot of slack to do a lot of stuff. So if you want to make a film, you're much more likely, everything is far cheaper to do there as well. The kit costs the same, yeah, but an editing suite, um, the other, the people you hire for the set, the set design, work is so much cheaper. So if you want to make a movie, if you want to make a little indie, you know, it's not going to be, it could be your little breakout calling card movie that you want to show people. I would say you're better off going somewhere else in the world where everything is a lot cheaper to do and where people will cut you the slack to do it. Uh, and then you've got your calling card. You know, other people here might be flunking around for five or ten years, but you can get it out of the way in 18 months. In somewhere like India or Nigeria, you could do it very, very quickly. Uh, and so do not discount that. That, you know, that should be a, like the way the world is moving today, you, you got, that is a massive resource at your fingertips. <coughs> and the thing I was going to say about on screen, yeah. uh, I think British drama sucks. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, so what you mean? Yeah, but I, mean, I think it's like, wow. I mean, it's. You know, Michelle works. Line of Duty? Yeah, I. Comedy. Brilliant. Duty, come on. Success. That's There's always a senior black cop for me. Yeah, I'm dodging. Oh, that's only two series. No, no, no. There was a senior woman cop and she was dodging. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. The, Why can't we be bad? Is it going to be bad? Keep going. The like, um, he's like his Giselle, fantastic actor. Still the best things he's ever done in America. String of Bell, was easy, yeah. the best TV character. Well, he said he had to go there to get yeah. work, didn't he? Wasn't he clocking? Wasn't he clocking? Yeah. Wasn't he clocking and, wasn't then, uh, and, no. and, and he did that brilliant movie, Beasts of No Nation, which is an incredible mm -hmm. performance. In that. Yeah. Both of those American productions. Um, I think this is, um, I'll be honest with you, like, you know, the, you know, we talk about the media inclusivity and all the rest of it, yeah. Um, Britain didn't vote Brexit for no reason, right? There is a reality to <laughs> this country. Maurice, you're not allowed to come in. <laughs> you know, there's like a, this is a conservative society that, that, that is quite resistant to change in all sorts of ways. And I see that. Mm. Yes. I'm, no, I know. And I, and yeah. I, you know what? I wish we had more time because I want to completely disagree with you when you've said something massive. We are a conservative society, I would say that. But we're a conservative so society that still allows people to do their thing. Yes, the in margins. London. At the margins. At, all right, I'll take margins. It's better than being in a society where you're not allowed to do it full stop. Well, I. Well, that's I'm not like, saying it's perfect, but I, you know, it's okay. We're muddling along. So, do I ever live in Russia than Saudi Arabia? Well, it's, what are you I'm doing? not far. No, I'm, I'm fine here, <laughs> thanks. Don't move me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be moved. I'm saying to you, you know, yes, the country voted Brexit, but also 51% well, well, voted Brexit. 49% yeah. voted I, I think, Stay. I think and, you the, know. When it comes to drama, I think the internet, again, is one of those things that's going to mm. change it all. Analog is basically. To be honest, I think analog will be just disappear. That I think all television channels. Are you mean scheduled telly? We're yeah. gonna we're gonna so go full Netflix. Yeah, everything is gonna be Netflix soon. Well, that's how. I mean, how many of you here? What? How do you watch telly? Do you watch telly 
on your eye? Do you watch it sort of as, as it comes out or do you watch it to catch up? Do you iPlayer? Do you watch it on your... On demand? Is on it all demand? on demand? Yes. See? Yeah. So, and I think that is going to free everything up because I think uh, established British television is very constipated in terms of its ideas. <laughs> it's very boring. <laughs> it's very slow moving. Everything needs to be signed off by a trillion dumbos. It does. Anything happens. But, but you've got to understand that the, the, the higher percentage of people who are watching TV, scheduled television, are over 50. Yes. And it's high proportion. And you don't want to be talking to them because they're boring. The internet is the internet is your free fire zone. You are very, very lucky. In Talk to the old people. You have none, right. you have none of the helps. securities that we had. <laughs> Make friends yes. with you the old people. This, you have none of the securities that we had. We had, you know, we were, for all of the problems we might have faced, with the, you know, there was a clear career path that sure. people could stick to. Mm -hmm. But creatively, you have so much scope. It's unbelievable. Like, so... Just get your teeth into it and, you know, regard the internet as your... Your zone. As your yeah. zone, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Look, I, I kind of want to get you to share some advice, but there's been plenty shared, and I want to see if anyone wants to ask any questions. There you go. Um, so you, you touched on digital like journalism opening, well, digital in general opening a lot more doors for success in journalism. Um, but do you think that it's endless room for growth possibly means that the lifespan for like successful journalism is shortened in a time where you know trends are announced so fast, <coughs> everything's just so like clickbaity? Okay, so long form juicy journalism or even drama actually, you know, but it's competing against BuzzFeed and clickbait. Yeah, but isn't that isn't that the nature of journalism that you have to keep adapting and changing and and, and doing what, you know, it's your audience, isn't it? So in a sense, even though I have no idea what you're talking about, I know that that if I like reading what you're what you're <coughs> writing and then I don't like reading what you're writing, you're going to write you're going to write something that I'm going to want to read. Do you see what I mean? So you're always going to want to please your audience. And you'll be able to see if your hits are dropping or whatever, you'll be able to change your tack. Whereas someone like my friend here just write some hopes that someone's going to buy a paper or... We, do. we are online as well. It's not, we're not living in the 50s. <laughs> I love yeah. the I do do that too. But one of the things I think it's worth considering is that um, the way television's commissioned, the way that stories will be commissioned at some point, if the internet continues, it will be on stats, it will be on hits. There'll be algorithms applied. London Live, did. London Live yeah. did. I went to um, uh, Darren uh, Orford, who I worked with at The Voice, um, was when I was setting up London Live, I went to meet him and was talking about how they were commissioned. And he said to me, it's all about YouTube. I'm just going on, I'm looking at who's getting the hits, I'm grabbing brothers with no game, and various other people who are established, who have established audiences and bringing them over. Now, I don't, I don't particularly like London Live, to be honest. I, think, I don't think it does very well, personally. I, I, I watched it and... But they've struggled and they've had to change their schedule right. promises, the, the, the things mm. that they, the kind of original programming mm. has had to be scaled back regularly. Right, yeah, but okay, so maybe he didn't do it very well, but as a, as a way of commissioning, I'm sure like, you know better than me. It feels like that's how that's how stuff gets done. You know, you, you, you Netflix can... is looking at the figures and telling yeah. you know they don't need to go and have a big old chat about plot. Yeah. They know who the stars are. They know what the subject is, and then they'll commission it. But they also have great writing as well. Yeah. I mean, they do these Netflix dramas do have great, great writing. Is, yeah. You know, they are. They, they, the they, budgets are big. The budgets are big, but one thing like the, the when I watch this is what I love about the internet is um, there's. This, there is, there is a quality there. I mean, people are not dumb. People are, you know, th there's really, really sharp, right? Keeping people engaged for 15 or 20 episodes, that's not easy. No, no, that is not. I, I will agree with you there. Um, any other questions from the floor about future journalism, digital, anything we've talked about with inclusivity? Is um, it? With the rise of Netflix, do you think television will die out eventually or make it and how do you think then, like Netflix will? Do you know what I think? I think this is just me thinking. I think Netflix will become 
uh, like it is already like a broadcaster in the same way that, and it already is, people are talking about oh, Sky and blah de blah and Netflix. It's now, it's now counted in as one of those very serious contenders when you're talking about where can you sell. So for, for me working at Shiver, we sell our programs. We don't just sell to ITV, we sell to as many broadcasters as possible. We're quite boorish, we have no loyalty. We will just sell to whoever wants to buy our product. And if Netflix came along, we said, yeah, we love that, we want that. We will sell to that. And I think in a sense, Netflix will just grow because people now know that it's not it's not a small thing, it's a big thing, and people who may maybe not have Sky films might just have Netflix. Do you, do you know what I mean? Because it's, yeah. it's probably cheaper just to have Netflix. Or you'll get it as part of a package and you won't have to think, oh, do I need that part of that package? Actually, I've got Netflix. Mm -hmm. And you can find your documentaries and you can find your feature films and you can find your mini-series and you can sit down and watch it one after the other, as I do, um, one after the other, because it's pure pleasure. Um, Breaking Bad, I lost my life to Breaking Bad. <coughs> it was two, three, four o'clock in the morning. I hadn't gone to bed because I couldn't stop. That's seven, six, seven, six seconds, five seconds, four, the next episode. Oh, I'll just do one more then. Because it, it's, it's pleasurable. And I think that's the thing is that I'm watching, I'm hoping, like how you kind of watch. Because I think it's really important to know, and that's the whole thing about bringing back to inclusivity, to know how our audience are reacting. And you're always going to have to um, grow as much as I might be quite established, is to still grow, to still have my eye on what's going on out there. And I think like you said, you know, like you've alluded to as well with YouTube, is that, that if you get hundreds of millions of hits on YouTube, People are looking at you and people are looking at what you're doing. If you're getting 100 hits on your blogs or your vlogs or whatever, people are looking at you and thinking, oh, what? that talent, she's really good, he's really good. I could get them in to do this on screen. And that's how it happens. And that's how people's careers really can take off. Um, but you can make an awful lot of money if you get sponsors behind you online. And really, quite a lot of money. Mm. Um, when it comes to like, the fashion blogs, like, I always see fashion as kind of like, a party that invites you but doesn't let you in. So I've got my own blog and Instagram, but I can have, so my dad works in IT, so I can have all these gifts falling down the page, all the technical type of stuff. But if I don't have the money to, like all the bloggers that I look at are kind of like what I aspire to be like. And if I don't have the money to buy the clothes or the products or go to the places that they go to and take pictures of, like how do I compete with with those people? You have to learn to survive. You really do. You have to kind of go in and sort of say, oh, I love your stuff, it's amazing. Could we just use this for such and such? You have to kind of think think slightly differently, and that's, I think, going back to being strategic. You have to sometimes, if you haven't got the money, and listen, we all grew up in no money. No money, no money, pocket money. Grew we had no still money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're still paying for it. We're paying for the debts. Um, but in a sense, if you wanted something, you had to kind of knock on the door and be cheeky about getting what you want. And that's sometimes what you may have to do because nobody's going to hand it to you. You have to ask for it. And you also missed a trick there. You've got a great blog, Diary of a Fashion Blagger. <laughs> like, you know, footage of yeah. you. Yeah. Foot no, that owns that. And he's <laughs> <got his own. laughs> footage of you getting thrown out of the deal party. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people will watch I, that. Actually, we watch that. Watch <laughs> <it>. <laughs> 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 I watch that. 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 I People love that reality stuff. So like, you know, if that's your story, tell your story. If that's what your story is, tell it. And that makes me want to mention again the authenticity that yeah. you guys were referring mm. to. The realness. By being really you, you'll be connecting with others. Yes. So it's, it's definitely a forum, a place for you to do it. And I sh you know how authentic your generation is? You're the hardest generation to advertise to in history. Advertisers don't know how to talk to you. That's like, they, they spend so much money trying to figure out how to use Facebook and Twitter, and you guys just, advertising just falls off, you don't care. Like, you are the most bullshit, like, uh, resistant. In, resistant 
generation in history. So authenticity is like a really, really, you know, all of us lot were conned into thinking you've got, you know, how to be the right, perfect kind of robot mm. that your boss wants. Oh yeah, but if you, I bought a Pepsi, yeah, life was good. Yeah, oh, but yeah. you guys, for you guys it's different. It's like how to be real, you know, that's your challenge, not how to fit in. Any other questions? It will be our last. Okay, well, listen, while I've got the opportunity, I'm gonna quickly say thank you to my incredible panel for just, this is the kind of conversation, you know, you hope you have on a panel. Thank you for being so honest and uh, <clears throat> authentic and talking about your experiences. We're gonna crack open the three bottles of wine <coughs> that we've got. And, uh, <laughs> sorry for, and some beer, and feel free to have a drink and, and tap them on the shoulder while we've still got the room for the next 15 minutes. The other thing we're going to do is um, we're going to leave the camera up and try and get a couple of you to give a reaction to coming along today, if you don't mind. Um, I know that a lot of you may not be camera ready, even though to <laughs> me you look beautiful. But we'd really appreciate What's a couple of you. Ready? Well, you know, the yeah. selfie generation. <laughs> You know, yeah, your entourage making sure you look good in the right light. Um, but if a few of you could do it for me, I'd be so grateful because we're trying to capture what it means for us to have these panels and conversations and to make copies of High Viz, which we have um, around. So if you haven't had a copy of High Viz, feel free to pick one up. Some of the writers are even in the room. Uh, but listen, thank you. In particular, I must say, I want to get all your titles right. I'm going to make sure I've got my piece of paper on the right. Thing. You know, I feel like I know you all. Uh, Michelle Matheson, uh, talent executive for Shiver, Morris McLeod, freelance writer, commentator, and uh, director of Media Diversified, and Nepal Daliwell, uh, writer, commentator, um, and author. Thank you all for coming in, in particular for coming in last minute as well. Uh,